Okay, yeah, there we go. Hi, so we're here um, to do a panel for the Lit Collective, who are based in Sheffield, and we're going to be talking about the importance of imagination and the future in the context of literature and um, social transformation. So I guess first we'll just kind of intro ourselves a bit. Um, my name is Mariam and I just finished my PhD at the University of Sheffield and my PhD is based on Islamophobia and trauma and imagination and future. Perfect, yeah. Um, <laughs> my name is Sahima um, Mansal Khan. I am a poet and I like to think of myself as an educator or I like to think of those two things in kind of tandem. And yeah, I'm, I'm uh, I guess, interested in writing and talking about um, disrupting basically the narratives that we hear about mainly race, racism, um, Muslims, migrants, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this particular conversation. I think the imagination is definitely um, an important space as somebody who kind of uses art as a medium to try and change politics as well. So we're excited. Yeah, I think um, the way that I've been thinking about it lately has been in terms of because I think in the last few months there's been the pandemic and different Black Lives Matter protests and I feel like when there are all of these conversations about freedom and justice um, I feel like it's natural to think about imagination and what kind of future you can imagine and who you can imagine that future for mm. um, particularly in terms of how I think in the UK a lot of the political discourse around this kind of stuff tends to say this is not our country if something goes wrong or we would not do this and I think that mm. like that collective we tells us a lot about whose uh, imagination we're using to imagine mm. the future, like for who mm. um, yeah so that's pretty much a quick summary no, yeah no that really resonates I think that just made me think about the way that also I think in kind of like the months that we've just been experiencing I sometimes feel like what happens is because we're also mobilized and we all want things to change but we also don't really give i think we don't see the imagination as something that you're actually supposed to invest in like we don't see it as something worth um thinking about and i think sometimes and i sense this in myself first and foremost as well as other people is just the pace of things kind of makes it feel like you know we need change now we need to do it quickly and, and i think in that we then fall into the trap of you know actually just reproducing things that sound like they're different um, but actually we're not using a different set of tools. So, you know, just creating the same thing. And I think with what you're saying, that I hadn't thought about it in that sense, particularly, I was thinking more along the lines of like, um, you know, let's, um, you know, uh, there's violence happening uh, against black people in the USA. Okay, so now let's perpetrate violence against the people perpetrating violence. And then I think in that, obviously we realize, oh, we're back in the same cycle again. Um, but I think that's a really interesting point that you raised about like who's, who we talk about when we're using this we of imagination and particularly in Britain. Um, were you thinking about that in light of like um, the conversations after, because um, I'm just thinking what, what that's brought to my mind is after the statue of Edward Colston was pulled down, also this kind of then contestation of like, because I think this is also linked to imagining the past, right? So it's like the imagination we kind of think is just about things that don't or haven't happened. But I think it's also very much about things that have and do happen and how we like to think they've yeah. happened. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I think that kind of uh, the narratives that is put together of history, so that whole discussion about like you don't actually learn history from these statues and the curriculum that we do have in this country is incredibly limited in terms of any kind of racial anything. Um, <clears throat> and I think I was also thinking about it in terms of how, for very good reason, people are talking more about how 2020 is like the darkest timeline or like this terrible year for so many people. And I think those kind of inequalities that we see in terms of who is affected in terms of the future become more apparent in a situation like a pandemic where, I mean, I hate to say it, but like unprecedented times that people keep yeah. saying again and again. I feel like there's a lot of discussions about 
who can afford to stay at home, um, mm-hmm. who can to live in like relative comfort in a pandemic, and who basically who can afford to keep themselves safe and keep themselves mm. alive. So I feel like collectivity is at the heart of all of these mm. different things, whether we're talking about like how history is taught in this country, um, how his, the symbols of history that are pushed to the forefront, um, the material conditions, in a pandemic, the calls for justice um, mm. in a protest. Like, I feel like a lot of that depends on collectivity and who this we is. Yeah. And we imagines a future and how so much of that imagination is hindered, like you say, by the past and what you understand of the past and what you consider to be ancient history and what you consider to be what well, we can't, we need to learn from history so we don't repeat mistakes, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think I'm just, that that also makes me think about the way that in a way imagination then isn't this um it's not like this luxury it's actually something we've seen people ha- you've had to imagine a different way of doing things because you will you will die or you will get this virus mm-hmm. or you will um you know sort of bad violent things will happen and i think that's also i don't know something that i've sensed in people kind of the way that we've responded to this pandemic and all the other things attached to the pandemic is kind of that um there's a there's sort of that one narrative of like okay we well, can't wait for things to go back to normal and then normal is imagined as this space that was always safe for everybody this space that was always you know well for everybody um and on the other hand i think you have a lot of people who've recognized that there was lots of things we told we w- we could never that were unimaginable you know like working from home or it was unimaginable that um i don't know just just the things that we've kind of had to adapt to really quickly um, or that we could maybe all prioritise somebody else's safety, that you'd wear a mask, not because you're specifically, although in, I think in this country we haven't necessarily uh, manifested that that imagination particularly, but I think we've, we've seen then that actually there was lots of things we were told are unimaginable, impossible and illegitimate, and yet in this moment of crisis, they all happen really rapidly. And, you know, I think in Portugal, they um, released all people in immigration detention and they fast-tracked citizenship. Mm-hmm. And these were things that were said that can never happen. You know, the whole system would crumble if we gave people citizenship. The whole system would crumble if if we, you know, provided safety for people. And I think that has then sparked that, what you're talking about, like this, this recognition that actually if things happen on a big enough scale, if there's a collective of us who imagine mm-hmm. something, actually it can happen and, and suddenly it's also about who on whose terms we're allowed to imagine because you I think it just this moment has also sort of revealed um you know our, our imaginations are limited not by ourselves but by what we internalize as you know throughout our lives um, and I think the messages of the past aren't just about like you know what is and isn't possible to imagine but also I can't remember what scholar it is who who wrote this but um, I remember coming across this idea that um, we don't even know what we don't know and that's sometimes something really difficult when we're thinking about um, trying to access you know alternative sources of history or kind of subaltern voices but I think applying that to the future is also interesting that we we can't even imagine what we can't imagine and, yeah. I, think that's, <laughs> and I think that's something that feels really <laughs> evident in this moment because it's like definitely how things are is not right and how they were is not correct how things could be it suddenly becomes this limitless field which I think is really exciting on the one hand but I think also very scary because it's like there's no rules here there's not really there's no one who can tell you what you can and can't do and I think for some people that then leads us to want to use you know we want to kind of build on what already exists which may or may not be a, a failing um I'm not sure I think we're very much in that moment absolutely yeah and it's so interesting that you say that because like so much of my research definitely by the end of my thesis, was about the unseen, the rape. Um, mm. Because I kind of had all of these, um, like I looked at different policy documents and different film and literature and things that basically just had South Asian Muslim women in them. And it was very much a case of like, things were happening so quickly as I was writing it that I couldn't really guess where it was going to end up. Mm. Where it end up was so much of it is about justice and what does freedom look like for different communities and Mm. I found the way like a really um fruitful way to think about the limits of imagination because it feels Mm. like to me I've understood the way or the unseen as something which is kind of like one of the fundamentals of Islam where Mm. it's about your faith in the unseen, your faith that there are things beyond your knowledge 
um, but kind of maybe because of that or in spite of that you maintain some kind of spirituality or faithfulness with Allah mm. and I feel like that idea is something which is really which speaks to a lot of the things that we've already mentioned where definitely um especially what you were saying about you can't know things you don't know mm. and I think that is exactly what the game is um <laughs> a useful way to think about um the vastness of these things so like whether, particularly with black lives matter where it feels historic and there's been a lot of things that have happened recently that have felt historic but like you've already said within that you kind of have to maintain the perspective in yourself and mm. your community and your collectivities that um you're you're able to hold on to some kind of faith in whatever form it comes whether it's religious or not um mm. That allowed you to just maintain yourself and and those communities. Yeah, no, I think that's such a really um like rich way of looking at it because I think that just reminds me of um you know which is a question that a lot of people get a lot of the time when when we are doing the kind of work uh, and I think it is work of of trying to imagine you know alternative futures or different ways that we can exist right now. I think often the question that I find people ask is you know, it sounds all great what you're saying, this world without violence and everything, but is it realistic? And actually my response to this question of is it realistic has actually been kind of what you're talking about, which is to say, you know, who are we to be so arrogant as to presume what is realistic and what isn't? And I think that actually it's not only limiting, but it is a, talk, it is a type of arrogance to kind of assume that we know already what the limits of the real is. Um, and I think, you know, as somebody who does have faith, as you say, in, in the unseen or in these kind of in a power that is beyond what we can control I think that also then allows for you to kind of lean into imagination a bit more because you can kind of say look what what do I have to lose by believing that world is possible you know there's nothing um because I think to even ask the question like is that realistic you're already applying all these limits on like or already what you've said like who gets to imagine but also like for who has what's realistic ever been a priority right and I say that with kind of to give a tangible example I guess of what I mean I was just thinking earlier today about um I think I reread that bell hooks quote about um the the margins and she talks about um uh, specifically African-American women but like this vantage point that they have of, of living in the margins um and I was thinking about how just by virtue of existing as like a Muslim woman today in the west or in the UK you you do have this vantage point because your marginalization means that you kind of see this world that isn't imagined to be real by others mm -hmm. and i think when when someone asks me like is that future realistic it's like well you don't even believe that my present is realistic if i tell you the, the yeah. land of that violence that exists you say well no come on that can't be real and so i think it's not just a contestation of you know imagining the future it's also a contestation of like no the present who gets to say what we're experiencing right now and I think that's why you know I'm just thinking out loud I think maybe that is also why it seems so important to me to contest narratives and I think that's mm -hmm. something that so many of us are invested in because it's really actually about a claim on what is real and what isn't and you know to say actually that's violent is a really big deal um yeah I'm just thinking out loud though yeah um because I think um with I feel like when when people are legislated and when there is policy written about people, um, that involves a process that is often quite violent, but is also seen as um, good government to yeah. have um, restrictive legislation, which um, enables the state to monitor certain individuals in communities. And I feel like once that process has already happened, um, the question that you were asking of like is useless to say is this realistic or not when clearly what is realistic is so dependent on where you stand like where you stand changes entirely what you mm. see and if you can change what you see then you can change what you can imagine mm. and um yeah that actually reminds me of um actually i don't want to misquote so i'm not sure who <laughs> i'm going to misattribute the quote um sorry that was clearly already done that twice today but i think um this idea that the way that you change the world is by changing the way that people think about the world. Um, and I think that actually, I think when I initially came across that, I was like, no, that's so like, um, 
you know, that's just, we don't have time for that. You know, we need to like, the, these material realities need to change. And I think, but I, I think now I kind of am more of the, that opinion because I think it's so, it actually only takes, you know, if a few of us collectively, and I say a few, I mean, well, I guess what I really mean is like a minoritized uh, set of people. So not necessarily few, but I think kind of marginalized for, for us to really think about the world differently does pose such a huge challenge and I think we know that it poses a huge challenge because we see that even when it's been you know small resistance forces whether that's during kind of um, imperialism and colonialism or whether it's been you know slave rebellions or whether it's it's been people who are saying we refuse to imagine the world on the terms you're saying you know I think race is such an interesting one because it's like these people just imagined this idea that you are inferior to me um, based on this, <laughs> this idea I've had and so I think it's that kind of reminds me then that the imagination is this really, I think like almost, it's almost impossible to quantify how, how important it is for us to contest it. Because if you, if you lose the battle for imagination, I feel like then you've kind of, you already rescind your rights, the material reality. Yeah. Yeah, because I think a lot of what we're talking about is to do with um, like the construction of knowledge and how do you know the things that you think you know um and particularly when i think racism and islamophobia are such potent examples of how um knowledge is purposely limited so like imagination is something that you cultivate it's something you work on it's a skill mm. it's a thing mm. you do um and equally while we're talking about that that is also the case for like your david cameron's and your boris johnson's like mm. the choices that they're making they're not just you know slipping through the education system and coming out the other end as like well we didn't know like that's a choice mm. um and that kind of cultivation is very abstract to talk about um because mm. as, as you mentioned materiality it made me think of how there are things that are very everyday that we do that are an investment in imagination and so often when you see Things that are happening to minoritized people, um, to your people, to yourself, whatever it is, the kind of weight that is put on your shoulders to react to that and to kind of always be in the moment and to react adequately and to help and change and do that kind of stuff um, can so often make you weary. And mm. I think, and sometimes I've have found myself in places where I'm like, well, I don't know why I'm doing any of this. Like, why am I? trying to have these conversations or do this writing. Um, and sometimes there isn't always a concrete answer, but um, in terms of an imagination of the future, I feel like investments that you make in imagination can be making dinner, um, cleaning the bathroom, like it, the material acts that make your very immediate future um, more palatable, mm -hmm. nicer a place for rest or something like that to allow you to like keep moving and to keep reacting. Mm. And I think that's also something to consider mm. well with that abstract mm. stuff. No, I really like that because I think also that that then speaks to the fact that, because I think all these things are true at the same time. And I think that's sometimes mm. what's hard to keep in mind. And I, and I think that I like that because it's a reminder that, you know, kind of going back to your initial opening question, like, there's not just the imagination there are imaginations and there's like this hierarchy of imagining and i think that when we're to, to for example to take your example of like mm, you know i'm gonna have dinner or i'm gonna clean this that's also an act i think of imagining ourselves um through our own framework as well and saying you know i am somebody who deserves to be cared for i am somebody who deserves to have nutritious meal i'm and i think that goes against that hegemonic imagining and, and the other thing that you made me think of is like with a lot of these conversations that have been kind of I guess more mainstreamed in, in recent months around abolition and you know how can we imagine an alternative um justice system I think something that I find we forget sometimes in those conversations is that it's I don't think it's necessarily this um act required of kind of imagining something that's just unimaginable currently to think so beyond what we know because I think actually with what you're saying there's actually many ways in which our everyday lives we already imagine and act out little kind of routines of justice that are much more kind of 
framed around accountability or restoration or, or a reparation of wrongs. And I sometimes think we we forget to look at the mundane for like inspiration because we think, you know, how can I possibly find you know, in the conversations that I have with my mom in the kitchen and making dinner, uh, you know, a, a, something that's the basis of a transformative justice program. But actually, I think that is where we find it because, and I, and I actually think it is quite a gendered thing as well. I think a lot of, uh, I think this is something very feminized about the, the kinds of ways that women have had to think about accountability and justice historically that actually provide like more room for imagining because there's been more imagining, I think, outside of institutional frameworks. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because I like I was thinking the other day. So, because I'm I've been away from from my family during quarantine and lockdown and all of that stuff, and I realised that one of the things that I really missed, which is absolutely feminised as well, is that being in the kitchen with my mum and my cousins, um, and at some point, like all these different dishes are cooked and then they're served and you clean together, and it's like you do it together but most of the conversations that are like the most interesting or the most loving happen as you're going in and out of the kitchen mm. and those will be conversations of like what have people been up to what are people watching what are people reading and I think it's one of those examples where it sort of feels I kind of I'm like hesitant to use this word because I think it's complicated but like healing in a way where um it's a space where it feels like you're settled in yourself you're not outside of yourself you're not trying to mm. prove anything about um limits of imagination from other people yeah you're more just kind of being and investing in your immediate future to make things nice or mm. to give space to other people to give space to yourself and it feels more um calm I guess than mm -hmm. what you imagine when you think okay we're imagining collective justice for the future go yeah, <laughs> like yeah. it feels very different yeah I think also what you're talking about feels to me like the same as um something I've noticed in myself in the last few months is um I think probably just because we've all been inside more is that actually when I go outside I'm I, I feel that I'm more aware of existing outside um, and in a way where I, I, it's hard to describe, I think maybe before, because, you know, you're inside, outside, you're going here, there, it wasn't something that I'm so um, kind of explicitly acknowledged to myself, but now I feel, and, and what, I guess the way I would differentiate it, just based on what you're saying there, is like, it's the difference between entering other people's imagined spaces and mm -hmm. my own, and it's like, and you know, I guess the other language that you could use is that when I, as soon as I leave the house, there's all these other gazes upon me, um, and it's like I suddenly, but I think as somebody who's, um, to go back to this idea of seen and unseen as well like as somebody who's kind of both seen and not seen at the same time it kind of feels like you do all this you spend all this kind of energy on understanding how others are imagining you as soon as you leave the door as soon as you're walking down the street and you go into a shop it's like you you're having to think about how you're being imagined in the imagined worlds of these other people yeah. and then when you're at home i think and obviously this is you know privileged to kind of be feel safe at home but i think within that and kind of having a home that I feel safe in I think it's also just the removal of that layer of all these those gazes and and knowing that I can I'm existing on my own terms and I'm imagining myself like you know when I do xyz thing it's no one's looking and I think so there's also something about those gazes as well with 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 what you're saying there and and kind of ha who's who's imagining you but also because I, I guess if you are you know somebody who's you know a, a straight white man I think you you're not really having to do all that work constantly of like how are others imagining me in this moment you know will this affect how I'm treated like am, am I safe to do this like how and I think that's there's also like then the, the labor of imagining and yeah I don't know just yeah I, I think there's the weight of other people's gazes and um this could be kind of a weird way to explain it, but it's like another kind of like the unseen. It's like another idea that I keep coming back to, which yeah. is to think about Islamophobia as a haunting and mm. like the figure of the ghost um, as a metaphor to understand what it feels like when you step outside and you walk down the street. So um, I guess I see it as like um, ghosts are conjured up by something. So ghosts are conjured in the eye of the beholder it, it's a relationship 
that requires a ghost and then a thing or an entity or a person that has done the conjuring. Mm. So um, I think that uh, explains the interaction of yeah. as an example. Um, yeah. And I think if this becomes a more complicated interaction when you think about what happens when the ghost looks back, mm. what happens when the ghost doesn't haunt in the way that it's expected to haunt. Mm. Um, does the ghost exist to whom does the ghost exist for right, right. And, um like when i i kind of like just fell into that rabbit hole for a bit but i no i like that um, it, it, yeah no, since it just reminds me of something that i read recently um so it's in a book that's going to come out soon called um i refuse to condemn but one of the um authors has written about this idea of um islamophobia as this tr as a tree that casts a shadow and Muslims stand by the shadow and are, are expected to con are expected to to prove that the shadow is not theirs. Mm. Um, and I think I liked that idea as well because it's kind of like I think if we then kind of just taking the second word of this um, you know this this conversation like futurity like how I'm just trying to think when so much of the time when I'm thinking about imagining the future it's also very much bound up with um because I work a lot with young people and I think something that I'm really, and I am a young person as well, I always hate that, I'm always like, where does young end? <laughs> young, like, when do you stop doing that? But anyway, um, but I think something that's really important to me is like, um, I suppose equipping people with the tools to imagine ourselves differently, because I think as much as, you know, we want to imagine the world, it really does, I think, begin from within and it begins with, with you. And if you can't, because if you can't imagine yourself outside of the terms in which you're narrated um and you know i come across you know 12 13 year olds who are already so apologetic for being muslim are so apologetic for being people of color you know are so aware that they need to try harder to assimilate to integrate and all these things but they're also aware that you know they're not going to be accepted on these terms and so i think for me imagining the future is actually a very personal project as well and it's this project of you know, I guess for me, this is linked to all those conversations about decolonizing ourselves and decolonizing our minds, but it's, it, it's not just abstract, it's so visceral and it has such a daily impact and a daily toll. And I think that for me, it's, it seems almost fruitless to talk about only how can we reimagine, you know, the state or can we reimagine, you know, how we structure our societies if, if we're not actually going to think about are we going to allow for people to imagine or are we going to provide spaces for people to imagine themselves yeah kind of unburdened by all the pressures that they have to conform to and how and how and i guess then that then the more the question i'm more interested in is you know if i wanted to create a world i, I guess maybe the barometer by which i can measure what kind of world i want to create in the future is that a child that is born into that world is able to as a child exist safely but also exist just on their own terms and i think that's so hard to articulate and even know what, what i mean by that necessarily i just know it would be the inverse of what exists now i think taking that as a start point then becomes it's almost like an exercise of okay so what would have to change for that to be possible um yeah yeah because I, I think the gap between like how things are and what it takes for the next thing to be possible sometimes comes at you in ways that you didn't expect so i've noticed myself like over the last few months um when you you so like going outside and some, sometimes when you see whether it's like other people on the bus or somebody that's serving you in a shop where when you get that look you know what they're thinking and you like your body knows maybe kind of before your mind does and you understand what's happened and sometimes it's a story for other for like friends who know mm. what you're talking about as in share some kind of minority aspect but it's not necessarily a story that you could easily explain to a white person for example because there's like a language of race and mm. other different intersections of like how your body moves through the world and sometimes i do find that like you're just like trending along mind your own business and something happens and I find myself going away and puzzling about it and thinking, what did I like misread about that? What happened there? What's going on? And then you remember and you're like, ah, oh, racism. Mm, mm. Because they, they must have caught you at a point where you were 
sunken enough in yourself and calm enough, feeling calm enough with yourself that um, you weren't on high alert looking for these kind of interactions mm. and you're reminded of it, even if it's for like three seconds or if it's for like 30 minutes, you mm. do forget and then you remember, oh yeah, racism, okay. And yeah. then kind of weirdly become smooth and you're like, okay, now I understand and you can keep it moving. And I think um, that is more apparent when you're talking to kids who are nervous to talk about things that would be called their identity when they yeah. might be talking about something that happened last night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think yeah. those are really like important interactions. Um, like Definitely. it is possible clearly. Yeah. And it, it makes me think as well about um, like, just I'm just thinking about a phrase that people often say, like, you know, if you, if you validate, whether it's this child, this imagined child we're talking about, or whether it's just an adult, um, you kind of validate an experience of racism generally. Um, a lot of times I find people who, you know, don't have access to having these conversations a lot will say, oh my God, I thought I was imagining that. Um, or like, I'm so glad I wasn't imagining it. And I think that's really, just in terms of the conversation we're having, is interesting because that brings me back to this thing that I have said before, and I'm sure lots of people have said, which is just that, you know, I think one of the elements of, um, of of racism and the kind of colonial modern world that we live in is that we are manipulated. And, and I think when I learned what the word gaslit means and meant, I was kind of like, this is what racism does. It tells you that the reality you're experiencing is not real um, and that you are imagining it. Like every time you think these things have happened, you're, you're making it up. Um, and I think that's, I don't know, there's just something in that as well that's kind of like, how do you when we're talking about unlearning and kind of, you know, being equipped enough to kind of um, be able to exist calmly in, in kind of in yourself, that that also then requires like, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not, I guess you're not on like an even playing field. Like the imagination you're against is this all consuming one that's going to tell you you're a liar, you're crazy, you're, you know, in, and, 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 you know, we know that actually has real repercussions, like people ending up in psychiatric wards or whatever for, or in prison because it's like you imagined the world incorrectly, you making it up. Um, and that has real, you know, yeah, I think it's just, it's hard as well to explain that. I think going back to the child thing, it's hard to explain that to a child that you're, you've been lied to actually, like mm -hmm. the world that you're experiencing, that you, on a gut level, no Israel is real and I remember this girl I think she was about 13 years old um and she she just described something like this and I remember thinking that's exactly what it is and it takes people so many years to understand that this is something really violent and she was just like you know sometimes when I go out people give me a look and I and I just know it's a bad look it's not a good look and it's like in that is is everything but saying that you know it doesn't sound this is like, okay, well, you know, maybe it was, maybe it was just a look that was okay. And, and that, yeah, I don't know, that just came to my mind because it's like, yeah, con constantly having to, I guess going back to that thing of what you're saying about collectives, I think one thing that I've always found is really important in kind of having other people to, to validate what I, how I see the world and what I'm seeing in the world and what I'm seeing in, in myself. Because I think because of that kind of mass structural manipulation, it's like that's the only place I think then you can find solace and once you have kind of been validated you I think you learn yourself then to trust that more and to go yeah no I know what happened there and I don't need anybody to tell me because I I, I kind of gonna just lean into my own knowledge and I think that goes back to what you're saying about different types of knowledge you know like an, our embodied experiences are a form of knowledge we can actually tell you so much more about racism you know that 12 year old girl can than some theorist who has never experienced it yeah, like as much as it is the case that people were likely to be in a situation where their entire being is um, disbelieved in some kind of way and is the limit of somebody else's imagination, um, and that will, can happen like hundreds of thousands of times, um, then it's also equally possible that affirmations from the people around you, um, mm. or virtually, are affirmations that can help you understand these things quicker because yeah. in 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 the here and now some of these things are not going away like the structures are not going to crumble overnight but it's still important to have that affirmation to make sure that you're kind of 
flexing like your muscle of imagination like it's a thing that you work at and that's mm-hmm. true whether you're talking about the imagination of out and out racists and of people mm. that are going to be anti-racists mm. and i think also then that is what gives you the impetus to be able to organize to build that that mm. other world because even just you know in my limited experience like when as soon as i found that collective of people who validate me and i validate them and we can say you know you're not imagining it that's real then somehow i think that just takes you to the next set of questions then where you can go oh we're not just because i think i feel really sorrowful about how many of us get stuck in just that initial set of questions is this real is it not i'm imagining it am i not and it's like the actual conversation to be had the far more interesting conversation i feel is yes of course it's real so now what do we do how do we change it what does that do what does them telling us that's not real do and i think that's where then you can begin to sort of um i guess actionable things can happen there and and yeah i think just in my own experience it's it's once you've had that affirmation that then you go okay so you know what do we want to do do we want to raise other people's consciousness about this do we want to kind of let other people know this is real or do we want to you know ask for things to change do we want to take a direct action to make things change um but i guess i also wonder like i was just thinking about this recently do, do you feel at all that like our even the kinds of what we do to change the world feels really limited sometimes and it feels like people kind of there's only like three i'm just thinking about what i see online and stuff and it's like okay so we've seen you know we've understood i think a lot of us that there's this there's a you know inherently racist kind of world system that structures how everything is and yet in response to that everybody says like we'll sign a petition or you know fundraise this thing and i and i don't actually begrudge them because i think a lot of that is just because we we don't know really how else things are supposed to change yeah. and so yeah i was just wondering what you think about that and like where do we find the where do we find the tools to imagine alternative ways of changing things as well because i think that's really scary and it's really hard to actually motivate people to to get involved with something that might not work mm-hmm. even though those things don't work either right yeah, yeah i think um I was, just, I was just thinking about the the black squares on instagram that everybody was doing yeah which was an example of that where i found myself just like absolutely infuriated with people that i saw on my instagram putting them up and having them in their stories and these are people that are otherwise like horrifically racist and i know mm-hmm. that because i've interacted with them and i feel like yeah it's um as you were talking i guess the first thing that came to mind was that um, if we're we're going to be thinking about how the material actions that are about investments and imaginations into your future, um, I think when it comes to like, what do you do like when something is wrong, when you can feel the sorrow or the grief or the pain of structural injustice, how do you have the strength that it takes to be invested in coming up with alternatives, coming up with solutions that are not piecemeal? And I think part of that um, I have found is that you need to give yourself time to think about what is useless and why it's useless and how that makes you feel. Because I think that kind of feeling of thinking that this this thing that people are trying to do is not going to go anywhere. And I know that because I've done this so many times before. <laughs> it's part of the gaslighting. It's mm. like all of these decolonial projects that are in vogue now. We've seen different iterations of this before and the iterations come and go. Mm. I think what's important is that um, we can maintain ourselves long enough to see that these, whilst the iterations might come and go, it's good that the work is developing, it's good that the terms are changing, it's good that the people, that the faces that are at the forefront of this are changing. Um, because I do think that it needs to be a collectivity, it needs to be something that is done together and that together changes. Mm. Um, yeah. I guess the other thing is also that in terms of collectivity in the future, a part of that has to be that there are going to be people that are not here to see that future, there are going to be people that don't survive it. and. I think that I found that a really big question to struggle with of all this community work and trying to connect with other people that see the world in the way that you do, that are trying to imagine the same future for you and for people like them. There are going to be people that don't survive that. And Mm. what, 
how do we incorporate those people into these visions? Mm-hmm. Um, because I think as much as there isn't one way of imagining that it, we're not, we're also not just imagining one future. Yeah. There have multiple versions of that. Yeah. Be in any way, I guess, realistic or reachable. Yeah, no, no, I think that's such a important question. Um, and I think that also just, for me, I, I hold that thought in conjunction with um, like what I was saying earlier about pace and like how it feel, it, you, I feel like what you're saying there is actually goes against the kind of common sense um, thing of like, everything must be quite quick, like we need to do this really urgently. Um, and I, I'm always reminded when I think of that of, um, um, I think it's something that the Zapatistas who are an indigenous Mexican group of people say that um, you should try to imagine, what do I want the world to look like seven generations from now? Um, and I think maybe we also kind of have to, maybe in imagining all in these futures and however we want to state it, there's also a level of humility required, I guess, to say that, you know, this isn't for me. And, and also what does it, if you, if you ima- if you're imagining a world, but you actually take yourself out of the equation, what does that do for the world you imagine? You know, is that maybe that actually enhances the project? Because I think there's a, obviously ego is present in all of us and in all of our thoughts and thinking, but I think maybe that's also something that undercuts collectivity at so, so often. And we've seen that happen obviously many times throughout our history, but yeah, that, that's, that's one thing that I was thinking about when you were speaking. And the other thing I guess is like, um, well, I've lost the other thing. <laughs> Just about, pay- yeah, about pace and, um, yeah, I think I think it also goes back to like maybe sometimes we get very caught up in like the the end. So it's like this is the world we want to create, um, and then it's like how are we gonna get there. But I think in that in that conversation around how we're going to get there, um, I guess maybe this, and I'm just saying this because it's something that I've noticed in myself is like I think we. So I think that I think sometimes we kind of lose this holistic vision of like and I think this is something that I find really Islamically is is there but it isn't really present in the world I'm in which is like and or in myself necessarily which is just if I was to think about just as holistically that would include you know bringing my full self to that conversation and therefore what does it mean to do justice to yourself and I think having conversations about justice that are holistic actually requires to rethink how we think about ourselves in a way that I find actually really difficult because it's not something you're used to you've been um just been inculcated in you i suppose in the world that we live in um but i think doing that kind of does promise a much more rigorous collective future because it's like if everybody was focused on their internal world and then you were in focus on kind of your immediate circle um over time and over kind of a period that that would have a really revolutionary impact and then uh, at the same time then i think I, i'm torn because it's like um, I guess that vision is almost require kind of requires like a, a there's no state in that picture right there's no like organizing apparatus that is at the same time coercing and suppressing people and so I think there's always that kind of thing I think I think what it does is it just puts a big onus on us where it's like you're simultaneously trying to imagine you're you're almost trying to imagine for the oppressor as well as for yourself and I think that's a really like it's just a really cumbersome task. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to ask of one person where sometimes <laughs> it feels hopeless for good reason um, or it feels like you don't have the reserves in you to come up with what the next thing needs to be and that maybe is a sign to be able to do what you're talking about which is to step back into yourself mm. and to be able to see yourself Um because I think if if that's possible, if you can recuperate in some kind of way, then that interaction that we were talking about where you're walking down the street or you're on the bus and you can feel mm. it on you becomes an interaction that is easier to bat away and be like, I, I know who I am and I know what I'm doing. Mm. And, or even if I don't in in general in this moment i have enough to be able to push that to the side mm. and carry on with what like whatever you're up to because i think it's like we said throughout the whole conversation it's it's more than one thing at once 
Yeah. Uh, and I guess it's about allowing yourself to feel the different range of emotions that come with having your existence being gaslighted. Yeah. That is like a deeply violent thing to have on your body. And if you keep pushing it down and pushing it down, it's, it's just going to be a ball of pain, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, we know that has so many physical, you know, like manifestations as well. Like this is an mm-hmm. emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, and, and has all these repercussions. And yeah, just one other thing that I was wanting to mention as well was like, um, I was thinking, um, I was just having a conversation with a friend the other day and um, we were talking about how, how much easier it is to imagine a dystopian future than a utopian future. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you even think about cultural output, you know, films, TV shows, books, whatever, it's, I think it's much, um, it's like, it's much more easy to see how we would end up in the dystopia, right? And like, we're already there and some people are, have been there for longer than others, right? But I think... That then begs the question of, um, you know, I don't think it's an accident that it's so difficult to imagine utopia either. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about kind of being deprived of, of certain knowledge as well and being deprived of certain resources. And somebody else that I was speaking to said that, you know, if, if um, <clears throat> sorry, if the left was sort of like, had the resources and broadly, let's see, use the left, the left had the resources of, um kind of you know the wealthy conservative elite of the world you know do you think we would do projects like i'm just going to fund you to imagine for a year um what the world could look like and how we would get there um and what difference would it make and so you know in a way i kind of that just made me think as well that maybe you know maybe not berating ourselves for kind of the lack of imagination or the lack or the difficulty we find in imagining because it's also like there's a very real lack of time like just like we've already discussed all the things that energy could go to and it's like then on top of all of those things i would rather imagine the nice meal that i'm gonna have right and i and i think you're right that is a radical act because of the world i live in but then where is the time to sit down collectively with people and different people the people who i want to survive it and you know people who i might even not think of wanting to survive it yeah and and imagine collect and i just think that's something that you know, the current world order, ironically, doesn't allow the time or energy or space for. So that kind of becomes a bit of a catch-22 to me. And then I, I, I kind of, for me, the conclusion or the resolution I rest with then is that it's not really about realising that world. It's just about struggling for it. And that in of itself, I believe, is kind of what gives us value and gives this world value. And because otherwise, then I think it's just nihilistic, isn't it? It's just like, well who knows if we'll ever get there, I give up. And I think, yeah, maybe I just can't, I can't, that can't let that be true. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Like, I feel like that's what they is. It's like a, an investment in the future and a belief um, in some kind of spirituality beyond yourself where maybe the reason that you can't imagine that utopia is because you're mired in the dystopia that you're in because what could be more dystopic than... I don't even know if that's a word, but what could be more dystopic than um, some of the things that we've described about what it feels yeah. like the body to be under this kind of gaze. Mm. And I think it is part of these kind of structures to, in order for them to perpetuate themselves, it has to seem like it's immovable and it's been there forever. And yeah. time, I think, is also really important. So we've had all mm. these things like collectivities and um histories that are that kind of are like the linchpins of how we think about the future but so is time and Mm. ordered time because Mm. um it's just it's making me think of some of Stuart Hall's work about the oppositional gaze and of looking better and how he talks about inventing futures and I think that kind of op- oppositional gaze, something that like disrupts or something that allows you to remember who you are. And I mean that like in a collective sense, in a individual sense and in a historical sense of like how you came to be here at this moment. Um, that That is you inventing the future. And yeah. some days that's going to be these bigger conversations about knowledge. And some days that's going to be 
realizing the the stress that you've been under and the pressure yeah. that you've been under and taking a step back and mm. pausing because it's not something which it's not it's not a it's not a sprint yeah it's more like a marathon that reminds me of, i think um there's a recent video of angela davis talking about kind of how, how she takes care of herself um and i think one of my friends shared that with me and was just like it's so reassuring like this is the only re you know the only reason she can make it this far and still be able to think you know and have the energy and the time is because she also is doing you know i think it's those things in tandem and it just that what you're saying that reminds me as well of what you said earlier and what it's pick up on which was about um the place of love as well in imagining and um you mentioned love and healing earlier and i, I it made me think that you know I really do believe love is like this really um, miraculous force that as humans we have the capacity to to do. Um, and I think that's something that's really like, yeah, it, kind of incomprehensible. But I, I actually believe that, that then in, in this conversation about imagination is probably the thing that makes us imagine the most. Because if you think about the things that people will do um, for love um, in the sense of, you know, I just think about some of the most horrific kind of stories of, that you hear of, or that I have the privilege to hear and not have to experience of people who are refugees or fleeing and the kinds of decisions that you might make that seem unimaginable to me. Like, you know, what would put you in a position and obviously the desire to live and be safe. Um, but I think a lot of times people narrate this story about their children, right? That the, the love that I have for my child is what propels me to imagine a better future. And I think there's something really powerful in that as well, because it's like, there's um it kind of goes back to what we're saying about maybe that selfless kind of imagining like how do we do a selfless imagining and i think love is maybe what what is required because then you're not building this future that you're imagining around yourself and your well-being but it's around like i genuinely am so invested in your well-being um if not the same as even potentially even more than my own that therefore i don't even have to be here for that world I just want you to be it. And I think that's the something that, yeah, for me, it's like without love, imagining just then is this very like, you know, it's like an Excel spreadsheet then. It's like, well, we've taken all the, <laughs> the magic out of it. Um, and I feel like this last, you know, I would say the same thing about art as well. It's like art, I believe is like, really just a, a label for a space where people are allowed to legitimately imagine. Um, and you can get, kind of get like, you know, uh, valorized for it in a way that in other spaces you wouldn't necessarily. But I think what, what art, art that's good to me or art that kind of makes you feel something is art that makes it, it it's that, it's the feeling. It's like, and then that comes back to me to love because it's like if you, you only feel anger because of love, you only feel, I don't know, that range of things that make you want to move and change and do things. And I think all of that stuff is just, yeah, I think it's so uh, crucial for the, the 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 work of imagining because otherwise, as I say, yeah, it's just a sort of exercise. Yeah, yeah, that was that was amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, <waxing lyrical about laughs> love. yeah, because it's like if you sometimes it's not always possible to be able to imagine these things for yourself, and that could also be part of the problem of like why you mm. can't in utopia, but. For example, I always have more reserves for that kind of thing when I'm thinking about my sisters and what kind mm. of people we want them to have. And it's like, if you can't imagine it for yourself, sometimes it is always easier to imagine it for the people that you love. And mm. in what form that comes, whether it's your family or your found family or whatever it is, yeah. that sometimes can be the thing that sustains you yeah. for sure. That's so true. Yeah, no, that's beautiful, actually. That's a beautiful thought. Yeah. Because I also was thinking, like, sometimes if, if this whole, like, imagination future thing was, like, a quick fire round, it's, it says a lot that, to me, the first thing that came up were, like, the, like, financial stability of, like, if I could give that to, like, the people that I know, where you hear the details of, like, how they're struggling and what would be most helpful to them, it says a lot about the function of capitalism, which seems like one of those things that is completely immovable. Mm. And, timeless and can never change and know it's not going to happen in your lifetime that kind of thing yeah but it's like if you had three seconds to think of some kind of imagination or future for it that's the thing where you're just like what financial stability affords people and what it gives them to do like you mentioned earlier about like giving somebody a year to imagine yeah. things like that 
are I think things that shake the future and mm. sh- shake what it, what is what is possible and I think that speaks a lot to like the material side of what we've been talking about and like the knowledge side of what we've been talking about yeah. that kind of stability changes it would change everything for so many people and for so many people would mean the difference between life and death mm. in a very real way and then also in a very spiritual yeah kind of way yeah no def- I definitely that's that's uh really important I think not to lose sight of that and I think yeah I, I think that's why the, I guess we almost in a way keep kind of keeping these two things in conversation or not two things but these several things because it's not it, it can and it has never been and it can never be I think one or the other and even you know like the, I think something that I always um try to remind people when we're having a conversation about imagination as well is just like um that when people are saying those things like you know this is unchangeable or unmovable or i think it's also that's when it comes back to that thing of deprivation of kind of knowledge of history equals deprivation of imagining the future because i think if we can if we are actually able to um recognize that things are historical that things are constructed that they have beginning and end then we're also able to kind of reimagine things much more easily because if you see that something was made, it can be unmade. And for me, that was, you know, that's such a been a, such a, I think, powerful part of learning, you know, seeing, okay, how did, you know, how is Britain as it is? How is the economic system as it is? How's the, you know, the, the racial system as it is? And, you know, knowing that race is constructed and racism is therefore a system that has been man-made, it's very easy to go, okay, then there must be an end to it because... Yeah. And, you know, and again, for me, that, that links to faith as well, because it's like there's there is no authority and there is no system that is man made that can kind of exist above the authority of God. So in that case, then you should be able to take it apart. Do you know, what I mean, there's nothing to yeah. stop you that doesn't have it. Whereas I think, you know, I think there are these systems like capitalism, like racism that assert a kind of godlike authority, a kind of miraculous um you know, and then, you know, you can even take, like, I was just thinking then, like, you know, the manifest destiny, like, discourse that America has, this idea that we are actually, um, you know, our, our racism is God-given, our right to exist is God-given, and I think that's, yeah, that they're also tools, I guess, that we have to contest um, those ideas by just saying, well, look, if something was made, it can be unmade, and it's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have no thoughts, <laughs> but yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that also wraps up neatly, very neatly, what we were talking about. So maybe we can leave it there. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thank you. This is fantastic.